Good evening, everyone. This is Sunday Online Law Class for the Vocational Science of Freedom. We have moved to a new platform. We were kicked off of Discord once again, and we have moved everything to a new server, new platform called Gilded. The link to how to find us and how to join the Gilded server is in the Vocational Science of Freedom YouTube page in the upper right hand corner on the banner which is where the national popular assembly link or national popular assembly discord link used to be a uh, little little aside as far as the discord is concerned we found that discord was being funded by the chinese communist party through a proxy company shell company called tencent and so it's no surprise why the recent purge in October, middle of October 2020, happened to just about every single group that spoke, talked about freedom or organization or even anything, basically anything Republican, anything Q related got whacked, anything freedom related got whacked, and we all pretty much got the exact same bullshit template boilerplate email that said you were on a server that had posted such and such or whatever basically we don't like you everybody got the same everybody got the exact same email uh no no reasoning whatsoever to it other than we don't like you and the reason they don't like us is because the new world order is not going to tolerate groups like this particularly this particular group because we had a hundred and I think we were up to 190, something like that. We were getting back close to where we were at prior to the May purge, which happened, which happened in May 2000, uh, 2020. And we recovered from that, and I put the server back up, but I knew in the back of my head that it was just going to get knocked out again. So anyway, so now we're on the new Gilded server. This is an American-owned company. They only have $7 million in investment capital, so... They don't have exactly the same capacities as some of the things that Discord did, as in they don't have document sharing, direct, direct document sharing like Discord did. However, we're going to get around that by using Dropbox links, as you can see, where we can share everything through Dropbox, and you can just go and download everything off of Dropbox. And then, of course, we get to keep, and we always keep our information. So there isn't ever going to be anything on a server, say, for whatever reason, not that I believe that this would happen with this particular company, but you never know if they sell out, whatnot. We will not lose the information that we're going to post on here. And everything's going to be either a Dropbox link or a link directly to a Mega Download or some other sharing site that we know that we can keep all of our documents and information uh, secure on. Because this is this is this is the last time that I'm going to be censored in this way and capacity. I'm I'm done with it. And there's no reason why we should be, and there's no reason why we can't find platforms that will not do that. So, uh, which is why I'll also be moving everything eventually off of YouTube before they whack me, because I know that day's coming too. To uh, Library TV, Library TV, uh, and or to uh, BitChute. So those two will be the other two platforms that will move everything to from uh, both the National Popular Assembly classes that I have on the the VSOF YouTube channel and also the rest of the VS YouTube, the VSOF YouTube videos that we have for the, the monthly online classes. So without further ado, we left off last time in the grand jury classes on, on a book called On Self-Government. Uh, please refer to the last Sunday class that we had to look at the first four documents that we covered in that class, which was on self-government, the citizen's rule book, the grand jury letter to a judge from a foreman of a grand jury uh, discussing his and stating his frustration about the influence and the basically the meddling of the district attorney and the failure of the clerks to help him do what he needs to do as, to fulfill his duty as a grand jury foreman. Very interesting letter, worth a good read. So please check out the, 
the past grand jury class to take a look at that. And you can use this link in the National Popular Assembly, the, the Dropbox, and and grab all of the documents that we'll be going through for the rest of the grand jury classes. We'll, we'll go through a couple tonight, and then we'll finish up the last two classes with the rest of the documents. So for tonight, I'm going to start with and go over Hale versus Hankel, or Hankel, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And this court case was way back in 1906. And I've spoken about this court case before, but it's good to go over and have a complete synopsis. So what I pulled up is the the appeal from the Circuit Court of the United States for the Southern District of New York. So what happened, give you a kind of a rough overview of the background of Hale versus Hinkle. Basically what happened is that a grand jury was demanding that a corporation uh, produces books, which is called a subpoena. And so the grand jury can subpoena any books that they want to from any corporation. The corporation is the creature of a state, or is is a creature of the state, and the grand jury is above the state. The people are always above this government. That's why the grand jury is referred to sometimes as the fourth branch of government, even though technically it's not has anything has, has nothing to do with the government at all because it's it's above it. And what I explained in the last class, last grand jury class which you can feel free to go back and listen to, is how the Magna Carta set up the the grand jury. So I won't reiterate that tonight. But to get into Hale versus Hinko, what happened is that we had a uh, we had a situation where the grand jury subpoenaed documents from a corporation. And the holder of the documents from the corporation, basically the registered agent or whoever, was, basically the 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 record keeper of whatever particular documents they were going for or asking for. And it was very lengthy. It was a fairly lengthy list, which is part of probably part and parcel of the reason why he thought, well, this is ridiculous. So I don't have to listen to the grand jury. This is crazy. And he asked the grand jury, he asked the grand jury, is there an indictment against, against the company? And they, and the grand jury said, no, we just want the documents. They said, well, I'm not giving, I'm not going to give them to you without an indictment. And so the grand jury wrote up a letter and then went to the chief judge and said, well, we're going to hold this guy in contempt. And the chief judge said, okay, fine. And he put his seal, put the seal of the court on it and served it to the guy and he got thrown in jail. And that guy went and said, well, you can't do this. They don't have an indictment and went and cried to the judge. The judge said, tough shit. You're being held in contempt by the grand jury. So he wrote, so what happened was that a habeas corpus was written out and filed for him to demand the, the nature and cause of the detainment. And the judge threw it out. He said, you cannot file a habeas corpus when the grand jury is holding you in contempt. They are literally above the government and there is nothing I can do. I can't even so much as look at this habeas corpus because it's a power above me. It's a, it's a power above all government. And, and so he chucked it. So eventually the guy gave up the documents. Surprise, surprise. Um, or ordered whoever at the corporation to give him documents because he was sitting in a cage. But what it goes to show and prove is that there is no power higher than the grand jury. And in order to form a proper 25-member grand jury, as is stated in the Magna Carta, we all have to, as it is also stated in the Magna Carta, in Article 3, 4, and 5, have come of or come to full age. Now, not only in this filthy Roman civil law system are we presumed to be dead, abandoned, but you're also presumed to be an infant because or, because all you have to do is go look up 1 USC, which is, stands for United States Code. So you go look up 1 USC subsection 8 under definitions and go look up the word person. And you will find that a person is an infant. Okay, So everything that the federal government does when they use the word person, they're talking about an infant. So that's why it's so important to get your vocational science of freedom status docs done, which correct that presumption properly through proper proper due process by convening uh, a petite jury, by having a judicial coroner sign off on the fact that you've been found to be living, that you've come a full age, and that you're competent to handle your own affairs because the competency thing is always something that they eventually come back to. But I digress. So let's get back to Hale versus Hinkle. So I'm going to read the syllabus for you guys, um, or a bit of it, and then I'll 
I'll finish up with this, and then we'll uh, then we can talk about uh, USA versus Williams. So under the syllabus, so under the practice in this country, the examination of witness by a federal grand jury need not be preceded by a presentment or formal indictment, because as I said, this guy was complaining that there wasn't a formal indictment. But the grand jury may proceed either upon their own knowledge or upon examination of a witness to inquire whether a crime cognizable by the courts has been committed, and if so, they may indict upon such evidence. In summoning witnesses, it is sufficient to appraise them of the means of the parties with respect to whom they will be called to testify without indicating the nature of the charge against them or laying a basis for a formal indictment. So you don't have to even tell them why the hell they're there, right? Just say, here, come on, come on, little kitty kitty, time to answer some questions. And that's all you need to say. And if they don't answer, if they, if they don't give up the books, fine, off into jail you go. So to continue, the examination of a witness before a grand jury is a proceeding, quote unquote, within the meaning of the proviso to the general appropriation Act of 1903, that no person shall be prosecuted on account of anything which he may testify in any proceeding under the antitrust law. The word should receive as wide a construction as is necessary to protect the witness in his disclosures. The interdiction of the Fifth Amendment operates only where a witness has asked to incriminate himself and does not apply if the criminality is taken away. Now, that was his other argument. He said, well, I don't have to testify because it would be incriminating myself because he was part of the corporation, right, that they were investigating. The court said, no, 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 no. You're not being accused of being uh, criminally indicted. The corporation is. So we're removing the aspect of the Fifth Amendment protection. So he didn't have any, but for a very specific reason. So to continue, a witness is not excused from testifying before a grand jury under a statute which provides for immunity because he may not be able, if subsequently indicted, to procure the evidence necessary to maintain his plea. The law takes no account of the practical difficulty which a party may have in procuring his testimony. A witness cannot refuse to testify before a federal grand jury in face of a federal st statute granting immunity from prosecution as to matters sworn to, because the immunity does not extend to prosecutions in a state court. This is the importance of understanding whether you're dealing with a federal critter or you're dealing with a state critter. Okay, Federal stays federal. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people f screw up everything in their court cases because they want to mix federal case law in a state court proceeding, or vice versa. Federal stays federal. State, state, state. You have federal issues and you have state issues. Okay, so I'll just leave that there for now and I'll, yeah, I'll just leave that for there for now. So to continue, in granting immunity, the only danger to be guarded against is one within the same jurisdiction under the same sovereignty. Interesting that they use the word sovereignty. The benefits of the Fifth Amendment are exclusively for a witness compelled to testify against himself in a criminal case and he cannot set them up on behalf of any other person or individual or of a corporation of which he is an officer or employee. I specifically underlined that and put it in red because that is the bloody point. Now, in case anyone doesn't know, every single one of these private for-profit courts, all of these district courts that we have out here, they all have their own Dun & Bradstreet numbers. They're all corporations. So what could a grand jury do if it wished to? You form a 25 member grand jury in a county, you can pull the books of the entire circuit court. Hey, where's all this money going? Hey, why do all these judges have 501c3 slush funds? Hey, what is the, where do all these bonds go? Oh, how do you guys do a bond? Oh, so you're doing this and you're creating all this bond money and billions of dollars and you're sucking it all up. Hmm, interesting. We might want to look into that, right? Anyway, so just to give you an idea of where a grand jury, a state grand jury, can go with something like that. And if you want to do a federal grand jury, you could do everything from indict the Clintons to to bringing in George Soros as a war criminal, right? Or going and pulling the charter of Monsanto because it's a evil corporation that wants to destroy life. Whatever you want to do, the sky's the limit. But just know your jurisdictions and know which one you should be in. So anyway. 
So to continue, a witness who cannot avail, avail himself of the Fifth Amendment as to oral testimony because of a statute granting him immunity from prosecution cannot set it up as against the production of books and papers. Right? It's important. Guess what? If we say, give us the books, you got to give us the books. And as I said, the, one of the most powerful and important things we could possibly ever do is to get the books of these private for-profit courts. And as one of my crew said to me the other day, well, 501c3 is nothing but a non-profit corporation, but they're still a bloody corporation. So great, we can pull everything from every single judge that has all these 501c3 plush ones lying around and say, hmm, where'd you get all this money? Why is it you have five houses? Really? Anyway, you get the point. So to continue, <clears throat> the search and seizure clause of the Fourth Amendment was not intended to interfere with the power of courts to compel the production upon a trial of documentary evidence through a subpoena des tecum. Des te tecum? Tecum? I'm not sure how to pronounce that Latin. Ducas tecum, I think. While an individual may lawfully refuse to answer incriminating questions, unless protected by an immunity statute, a corporation is a creature of the state. And there is a reserved right in the legislature to investigate its contacts and find out whether it has exceeded its powers. Clearly. So, you want to go after any corporation? Feel free, but you better have 25. Because I can guarantee if you go after a corporation like, so, say, I don't know, the Federal Reserve, you're going to have people come down on you. But as long as you have 25, there's nothing they can do to stop you. But... You, as again, you'd better be 25 people, not 25 infants, throwing sand in a sandbox, or they will, they will come at you. But anyway, so to continue, there is a clear distinction between an individual, and this is this is the part of Hale versus Hinkle that everybody loves to quote. They always take this particular section, this section that I'm about to read, this paragraph as the what they like to put into court cases for the the holding. Of Hale versus Hinkle. And it's an important part of the holding, don't get me wrong, but I think a far more interesting part about Hale versus Hinkle is that is about being able to get the books from a corporation, and that there's nothing they can do to stop you, and that even a, a habeas corpus can't get your ass out if the grand jury wants to throw you in contempt. So, to read this, there is a clear distinction between an individual and a corporation, and the latter, meaning the latter corporation, being a creature of the state, has not the constitutional right to refuse to submit its books and papers for an examination at the suit of the state. Because technically, when you get a 25-member grand jury together, what you are literally being is you are the people of Colorado. That's literally what you are. You are acting for all of the people of Colorado. And when you do an indictment, it, it would read, and against the dignity of the same. So anyway, and to continue, an officer of a corporation which is charged with a criminal violation of a statute cannot plead the criminality of the corporation as a refusal to produce its books. Sorry, we're going after the corporation, not you individually. So give them up or you get to go sit in jail for contempt of the grand jury. Franchises of a corporation chartered by a state are, so far as they involve questions of interstate commerce, exercised in subordination to the powers of Congress to regulate such commerce. And while Congress may not have general vestitorial power over state corporations, its powers in vindication of its own laws are the same as if the corporation had been created by an act of Congress. So, to boilerplate that down into regular speak, basically what they're saying is that uh, things of an aspect of, of, what, of what Congress can do because of the Commerce Clause a federal grand jury can still step in and say, okay, give me your books, right? If a corporation only operated inside a single state and did not export any materials out of that state, I suppose they would technically have immunity from a federal grand jury is also the other way to see this. But because corporations cross things across, they cross products and whatnot and take things across state lines, they're considered to be an in interstate commerce and so therefore... Congress can basically come in and squish them, or we can squish them in the aspect of a federal grand jury because of the Commerce Clause, which is probably one of the single most important clauses that everybody needs to learn about, because it's exactly how they've been taking 
bits and bits and bits of power, the boiling the frog idea, over us for a very long time. And the Commerce Clause is one of the most sneaky ways to do it. But I'll save that for another class. To continue, a corporation is but an association of individuals with a distinct name and legal entity. And in organizing itself as a collective body, it waives no appropriate constitutional immunities. And although it cannot refuse to produce its books and papers, it is entitled to immunity under the Fourth Amendment against unreasonable searches and seizures, and where an examination of its books is not authorized by an act of Congress, a subpoena deuces tecium requiring the production of practically all of its books and papers is an indefeasible, is, is as indefeasible as a search warrant would be if couched in similar terms. So what are they basically saying? They're saying that once the grand jury decides to, to demand it says practically all of its books and papers, which is precisely what the grand jury was after, is as indefensible, meaning you cannot defend against it, as a search warrant would be if couched in similar terms. But when the grand jury does it, it's not considered a search warrant. It's a subpoena. And you say, gimme, because you're a creature of the state. You don't have any rights. All right? So, although a subpoena... Uh, Ducus Tecum, I keep pronouncing that in different ways. Maybe somebody will, oh, I'll look it up. I'll look it up later to figure out exactly how to um, state that, the, the, pronounce that Latin. It may be too broad in its requisition where the witness has refused to answer any question or produce any books or papers. This objection would not go to the validity of the order committing, committing him for contempt, which is exactly what happened. Because he didn't produce it, well, he got sent to contempt. He got to stay there until he produced it. This was an appeal from the final order of the circuit court made June 18th, 1905, dismissing a writ of habeas corpus and remanding the petitioner Hale to the custody of the marshal. The proceeding originated in a subpoena ducus tecum, tecum issued April 28th, 1905, commanding Hale to appear before the grand jury at a time and place named to, quote, testify and give evidence in a certain action now pending in the circuit court of the United States for the Southern District of New York between the United States of America and the Tamer American Tobacco Company and McAndrews and Forbes Company on the part of the United States and that you bring with you and produce at the time and place aforesaid, one, all understandings, agreements, arrangements, or contracts, whether evidenced by correspondence, memorandum, formal agreement, or other writings between McAndrews and Forbes Company and six other firms and corporations named. I mean, just right there, just think of the truckload of paperwork that would be from the date of the organization of the said McAndrews and Forbes company all correspondence by letter or telegram or telegram between McAndrews and Forbes company and six other firms and corporations again there's another semi truck all reports made or accounts rendered by these six companies or corporations to the principal company again that's probably three more semi trucks any agreement or contracts or arrangements however evidence between McAndrews and Forbes Company and the Amsterdam Supply Company and the American Tobacco Company or the Continental Company or the Consulate Consolidated Tobacco Company. And then finally, all letters received by the McAndrews Forbes Company since the date of its organization from 13 other companies named located in different parts of the United States and also copies of all correspondence with such companies. That's about another six truckloads. So you see where Hale was being a little bit um, uh, snarky about saying, well, you know, I don't want to do this or whatever else. Well, too bad. So I'd do it anyway. So that's what the grand jury was. So just, just reading that list and here's, this is what I'll do. I'll, I'll copy and paste this entire list because it's just ridiculous. Um, I'll copy and paste it into the chat because I just find it to be such an interesting um, list of stuff. So there, I just posted it into the chat so you guys can read it. And it, this, it, 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 when you just think about the, 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 the level of the totality of what they were demanding and then think about how much they were demanding and then think about how much th that that's the power of the grand jury. Grand jury can do that. No problem. Right. So literally produce everything. Well, practically, <laughs> at least they didn't ask for every single uh, receipt between them and any of their customers. That would have been absolutely batshit insane. But you could if you wanted to. So, with that having been said, I'm gonna I'm not gonna read all the rest of Hale versus Hinkle, but basically what happened is that is what I previously said. Um, 
they they tried to get they they asked for all the documents they Hale refused the documents. Hale was held in contempt, and uh, whereupon the grand jury reported the matter to the court and made a presentment that Hale was in contempt and the proper proceedings should be taken. Thereupon, all the parties appeared before the circuit judge, who directed the witness to answer and questions and produce the papers. Appellant still persisting in his refusal, the circuit judge held him to be in contempt and committed him to the custody of the marshal until he should answer the questions and produce the papers. A writ of habeas corpus was thereupon sued out, and a hearing had before another judge of the same court who discharged the writ and remanded remanded the petitioner. So, um, yeah, that's what happened. So, sorry, you don't want to give us books? You can sit in jail. So that's the aspect of Hale versus Hinkle. I'll leave all of you to go ahead and read the rest of this. You can download it off of the... Um, you can download it off of the the Dropbox and take a look at it. It's a really interesting to read the rest of it as to what they did and how they went about doing it. Uh, but I'll just leave that for now. So this is, this was just the, the best example that I've ever found or one of the best examples I've ever found of the power of the grand jury and, and some of the interesting things that they can do. So we'll leave Hale versus Inkle for now and let's move on to uh, grand jury versus Williams here. And I pause here for a minute and pull this up. All right, United States versus Williams. So what this was, was just back in 1992, uh, and it was United States petitioner versus John H. Williams Jr. Now, the correspondent, or sorry, the respondent, Williams, was indicted by a federal grand jury for alleged violations of 18 U.S.C. Uh, 1014. On his motion, the district court ordered the indictment dismissed without prejudice because the government had failed to fulfill its obligation under circuit precedent to present, quote, substantial exculpatory evidence, close quote, to the grand jury. Following that precedent, the Court of Appeals affirmed. Okay, so that's why it came before, that's why, that's why the appeal came before, and then it said held the argument that the petitioner should be dismissed, or sorry, that the petition, the argument that the petition should be dismissed as improvidently granted because the question presented was not raised below was considered and rejected when this court granted certiorari and is rejected here again. The court will not review a question that was neither pressed, neither pressed nor passed on impressed nor passed on past past means the lower court passed judgment. So that's what you say when it says passed on so that means passing judgment or giving some sort of ruling. So that's when the court passes on something. But there is, it's the continuing, Stevens versus Department of Treasury, so on and so forth. But there is no doubt that the Court of Appeals passed on the crucial issue of the prosecutor's duty to present exculpatory evidence to the grand jury. So that's why this thing came up. But there was an interesting thing uh, stated in in USA versus Williams. Um, I believe it was by, I don't remember if it was Scalia that said it. Anyway, I forget the I forget the particular judge, but in here, and I don't know if I highlighted it or not. Let me scroll down through here and see if I do have it highlighted. There was a there was a part of this particular case that said that the, that the Supreme Court said basically that if the people wish to convene a grand jury, there's nothing we can do to stop them, and furthermore, there's nothing that we can even do to control them, and it. Okay, here's a part of well, here's an interesting part of it. There is yet another respect in which respondent's proposal not only fails to comport with, but positively contradicts the, the common law of the Fifth Amendment grand jury. Motions to quash indictments based upon the sufficiency of the evidence relied upon by the grand jury were unheard of at common law in England. Think about that. You couldn't do anything, and you still can't, as long as it's a common law grand jury. So that, I'll... I'll add this little snippet here and copy this into chat as well because it's it's an important it's an important thing to, to realize um, that a common law grand jury when you're operating at the common law there there's there's nothing you can do against it nothing you can't file a motion to quash an indictment you're against you're you're against the whole of the people the entirety of the the epitome of the of the power of the sovereignty in the American people is in the grand jury. You can't do anything about it. So, yeah. 
and so that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect, of it, like I said, I and I'm not sure I highlighted. I'm going to scroll down all the way through here. I don't think that I did, but maybe I should. I I'll, when I find it, I'll post it in the chat later, or I'll I'll post it in the grand jury chat. Anyway, what the Supreme, what the justice said, as I recall, um, without being able to actually find it in here, what the justice has said was basically one: the grand jury can convene whenever they play want to. There's nothing we can do about it. Two. It's the fourth branch of, branch of government, which is a term that is commonly used with uh, grand juries. And three, that we can give no instruction to the grand jury. Uh, even and they, and they said, even though we have been asked multiple times to give instruction, we cannot do so. Because they can't start giving the grand jury, basically, orders, because the grand jury is above them. Uh, the slave can't, or the servant can't tell the master what to do, even if the master asks. Still doesn't make any difference. And so the importance of USA versus Williams, or United States versus Williams, is shows that that's shows that that power exists with and in us at all times, uh, regardless of what the courts may want to do or or not do. So, uh, so with that, we're getting on to about eight twenty. And I suggest everybody download all of the grand jury docs that I have posted in the in the Dropbox. And if anybody has any problems with the Dropbox in any way, shape, or form, please tell me in the VSOF Gilded server and put the information or uh, what you find uh, into the into the suggestions um, under forums. The neat thing about this Gilded server is that they have forums, so they have suggestions which you can create a topic, and then you can tell us uh, what you found out or what we need to fix and whatnot. And just for a quick rundown, I'll I'll run through the Gilded server here real quick, just to familiar, just just so everybody is kind of familiar with it as a last little part of this class. So these sections, the top sections, are what we can see when we're running the server, the overview, the members. Uh, and then we, we 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 can require applications, which is what I did. Everybody, pretty much everybody that came into this server had to fill out the application. I have some very simple, basic questions. It just gives me an idea as to where people's heads are at and uh, if they truly belong here or not. Uh, there was some there there were a few people that I did not allow in here because they they didn't answer honestly and they had no and they said that they didn't want to serve on a grand jury. And they also didn't know what the United States of America was. And they didn't know what the United States was either. Not that that's an automatically um, pass-fail thing, but um, they didn't really even appear as though they wanted to help out. So they just seemed like they were just going to be a bug on the wall. Well, this server is for people that want to get things done. It's not for. It's not just a echo chamber. Okay, this is for work. To organize. To teach, and to pass on. So you, after the applications, there's the audit log. That's everything that we do on the server. And then we've got the general voice and main chat. This is where everybody can hang out and share whatever they want to share. We have an announcements channel. That's where we'll post classes. We have a public events calendar. This is where I'll also post all of the classes and what I'm gonna, what the topics will be uh, in each, for each class. Uh, the rules are the rules of the server. And public notices are for also everybody on the server and also to the corporate gilded people, which we, well, you can go ahead and read it. I won't get into what we did. Uh, the forums, these, these will be expanded out. The soapbox is just whatever you want to rant about. Feel free to have fun, post it. And then suggestions. That's where please give us your suggestions as to what you may or may not be able to do, or if you encounter any difficulty with the server. And uh, then we've got, I'm, I, then after that, I'm going to mirror everything that I did on the National Popular Assembly Discord. So we'll have Trivium Education, Quadrivium, National Popular Assembly, which is of course where we're meeting tonight, and the classes are the same as how they were scheduled out. And I'll put the class information uh, as to what each class is, the number of classes, one through one through eight, and um, in class info. I'll put up the calendar, make sure everybody knows what's going on, and then I'll fill out the rest of the 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 server. And if you notice, there's different kinds of rooms. The ones that have a little hashtag, that's a text room. The ones that have a little checky mark, those will be list 
rooms, meaning like there's a list of things that we can do and we can check off that we got them done or not. I just put this in here for registered agents because these are the people that will be serving with the, the status docs, uh, certain corporations and certain uh, offices in the federal government will be listed in this room. And then that has its own voice room. Uh, the VSOF information, if it, people that want to join the Vocational Science of Freedom, be a member, and the memberships and prices of that and what we offer for services from the, the correction of the status docs, which will be the, I'll post the, the handbills for each and every doc so that people understand what they're doing before um, they get into doing it and why they need to do it. And uh, also, I don't allow anyone to just do the status docs. They have to talk to me first, and they have to, we have to have a conversation over the server is fine to update you and to make sure that you understand what you're doing because this is not this is not something where you get half pregnant. You do these status docs, you're out. You cannot go back. And so if you're not prepared and willing and understand what that means in all its totality, I'm not going to do them for you. <laughs> or I'm not even going to give them to you. Um, even if you want to, even if you want to purchase them, I, I have to talk to you first. So, and then we'll have the monthly calendars. We'll have the monthly uh, VSOF law classes here. I'll put the calendar up. This will be the text chat where I uh, share the docs and we'll do voice there. And then uh, under that, for some people will be able to see this and some won't. Vocational Science of Freedom members can see it, which is the Vocational Science of Freedom quadrants of self-reliance, self-defense, self-awareness, and self-governance, along with personal sovereignty. And we'll do get back to having a weekly class uh, which is basically more of a brainstorming between all of us, probably on Tuesday or Wednesday in the VSOF rooms for VSOF members. And then, as I said, I'll flesh out the rest of the rooms as we had them in the National Popular Assembly Discord before the communists took us out. So on that note, we've gone about an hour. I thank everybody for showing up, and I'll turn off the recording, and we can talk amongst ourselves.